So I'm going to read the scripture this morning. It's from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Verses 1 and 2 are in white, and those are what we covered a few weeks ago, um, and verses 3 and 4 are in orange, but we want to read it all again so that we remember the context. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Well, it's good to be back with you all this week. Um, I hope each of you profited as much as I did the past two weeks from Jack and Cammie's messages. Um, they were spot on, such an encouragement, very helpful to me. Um, so I'm extremely excited about this next series that we're starting today because it's going to take us all the way up till Advent, till the end of November. So as we all start looking forward to going back to school, um, as we look forward to getting into routine, all that the fall brings with it, Paul is going to be teaching us about what he means by that opening line up there when he writes, be imitators of God and walk in love. So if you missed that, or if you missed the last two weeks of sermons, strongly encourage you to go back and check those out online. They're only 20 minutes. It's like half a lunch break. Um, Very easy to get caught back up on that. Because as we learned, imitating God is perhaps our highest calling in life. It requires significant effort on our part in order to walk in love. Because as we learned, loving is a choice. It is an act of the will. It is not something that necessarily comes easy to us naturally. So the life of a Christian is not easy. It requires a complete reordering of our priorities because we've got to choose to love. I think so many people out there think that you just profess a faith You come to church whenever it fits your schedule, and you're good. But that's not at all what we sign up for whenever we place our faith in Jesus. Now, being born again means a completely transformed life. It means a life that's been transformed by sanctification, by walking hand in hand with the Holy Spirit down that well-lighted path, the path to holiness that you see up there. And it's also a life that's transformed by living out this habit of repentance, a continual turning from the things of the world and a turning to the things of God. So throughout the next few months, Paul's going to show us in very painstaking detail what it means in order for us to imitate God, to walk in love. And he starts today by highlighting a bunch of things that we cannot do if we are walking in love. Paul writes, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. So if you're a saint, if you've been born again, if you've been set apart as a beloved child of God, if you're faithful in Christ Jesus, if you're on the path to holiness up there, if you're someone who is walking in love, then you simply can't be doing those things you see up there in blue font. First, you cannot be sexually immoral, meaning any sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. That's as clear as I can make it. We love to blur the lines there whenever we can. We like to say, well, can I get away with this and can I get away with that? But Scripture is crystal clear on this matter. Sex was only designed for marriage between a man and a woman. And it can certainly burn super hot in the fire pit of marriage. But even a small spark that flicks out of that little fire pit anywhere else in the forest of our life, in the lives of others and the lives of ourselves, are set ablaze. Second, walking in love also means you can't be walking in any form of impurity for that matter. In the original language, impurity means unclean living, lust, luxury, or being wasteful. Isn't that an interesting characterization of that word? So this speaks to all activities that are unclean. It's all the repulsive stuff that we see on that wide, dark path. 
It's the foul sin in our lives, which clearly includes lustful thoughts, luxurious lifestyles that place a focus on extravagance and often lead to wastefulness. And third, we can't walk in covetousness, which means greedy, focused on materialism and status. In the original language, the word places an outsized focus on money and all that money brings along with it. Money is what allows us to purchase material things, and it's often used as a measure of our status. So if we're walking in love, we cannot be walking in greed, materialism, or seeking worldly standing. And notice, too, how each of these issues up here are all somewhat sneaky activities, aren't they? They're things that can be concealed pretty easily in our lives. For example, we can have a secret addiction to pornography or be discreetly lusting after someone else's spouse. We can be covertly greedy, amassing all sorts of material items or quietly fascinated with our status. And we can do each of these things without most people knowing that they play a part in our lives. It's what's captured by the phrase, riding dirty. And maybe you've heard the song before. The Urban Dictionary defines riding dirty as driving with any form of illegality. It's most often attributed to a subversive or a hidden delinquency of some sort. In other words, you're rolling down the road, you're not speeding, all your lights are working, you're obeying all the traffic rules, you even got a happy little yellow hipster ride up there. So the chances are you're not going to be pulled over, but if you did, you'd be in some trouble because you're riding dirty. Maybe your driver's license is expired or you have an unregistered gun hidden in the trunk of your car. Maybe you have an open beer can and one of those four mile coolies kind of tucked down in there so it looks like a seltzer or something, right? Or perhaps you got a sack of weed tucked up underneath the seat. Or it could just be that you're not wearing your seat belt. But either way, you're riding dirty. It appears on the outside as though you're doing the right thing. You're just rolling in your happy little car. But you're actually being sneaky. Because if you got pulled over, you'd be in some trouble. And I think we all know what I'm talking about here about being sneaky because we all get sneaky about things sometimes. And in this context, you can probably imagine a time where you were rolling in your car and you didn't have your seatbelt on. And then for some reason you come around this turn, because a lot of roads around here have a lot of turns in them, and there's a cop standing there maybe directing traffic around some accident or something. What do you do? You get all sneaky-like, right? You grab that belt and you slide over and you click it in and you hope that he didn't catch you, right? And some of you are nodding at me and smiling right now, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've done that. You've been there before. And if we're sneaky about anything in our life, we can be almost certain that we are riding dirty. And Paul teaches us here that we cannot walk in love and be riding dirty. In fact, Paul is really focused on this in the sense that he says, these things must not even be named among you. Or in the NIV translation, there must not even be a hint of this stuff in our lives. That's a pretty strong statement. Now why is that? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons. First, we may actually look at those sins and we think to ourselves, well, they're not that big of a deal. They really don't hurt anybody else. What's the big deal if I happen to be lusting or coveting something else in my life? I can still function as a saint. I can still drive my car down that road even if I'm riding a little dirty. Chances are I'm not getting pulled over. But you see, as a saint, all sin is nasty, foul, and repulsive stuff. Like that steaming pot up there. So there aren't degrees of sin because all sin separates us from God. And it's what happened to result in our Lord and Savior having to suffer and die such a brutal death for each and every one of us. So if we're born again, that means we're different now. We can't stand being around that stuff. We must put it off. Moreover, all sin hurts the entire body of Christ because we're in fellowship with one another. We each play a vital role in the body. We're represented there by each of those puzzle pieces you see. 
where Christ is the head and the Holy Spirit is uniting us. That's the picture Paul paints of the church. So you are impacted by my sin and I am impacted by yours. We're all in this together. And so not only do we need to stop walking in that nasty stuff, but we must not even speak of it. Second, remember as we learned back on the Sermon on the Mount, it's so important that we understand how temptation leads to sin. If you remember that teaching, you will immediately see this linkage to all this sneaky stuff. Recall that four-step process we talked about, how temptation actually leads us along the path to sin. First, there is an attraction. Something catches our eye or some thought passes through our mind. Second, we take another look or we give it a second thought. And in that moment, we are playing with fire. Because as soon as our imagination kicks in, we move along to that third step. And it's too late. We've crossed the line because imagination builds desire. Desire leads to lust and lust is a sin. And of course, we all know whenever lust persists, it always looks for an occasion to be fulfilled. So it's not just the physical act of sex outside of marriage, it's also the lustful thoughts that we entertain and carry around with us that Paul's talking about here. So you see, that's why these things must not even be named among us. Because we don't want to cast even the tiniest of embers that might spark an attraction that could cause one of our brothers or sisters to follow up or take a second look. Because at that point, we're dangerously close to crossing that sin line up there. Just think about what so often provokes each of us to sin. Isn't it often the suggestions or the corrupt talk of those around us? And that's why Paul teaches that these things must not even be named among you. So now you're probably sitting there thinking, shoot, this is a pretty high bar. I try my best, but sometimes I just trip up. Well, that's because we're human, because the devil is really good at what he does, and because we live in a sinful world. So yeah, we're all going to mess up sometimes, and that's why we say here at Four Mile Church, it is okay to not be okay. It's so important that you hear that. This is not a church full of perfect people. Every one of us are in process at some level or another. But that is also why we so quickly follow up with those words. But none of us want to stay in that not okay place. We don't want to stay there. And that means we need to be repenting. That means it's a constant habitual life of repenting. So the very minute we've been convicted of grieving the Holy Spirit, we must stop and enter into that process of repentance. And that is because of the nature of sin, which we so often describe here with that sin spiral you see up there. That green line, it re represents that straight edge of truth, the straight and narrow that we hear about all the time. And when we sin, we can so quickly spin further and further away from it. That's why when we mess up, we must turn back to it as soon as possible. That's also why Paul is giving us instruction about how to avoid these sins altogether. That's why he says, don't even speak of them. Because not only can they cause others to sin, but that sin spiral teaches us something really important. It shows us how we can quickly fall into habitual sin. And that is clearly a point Paul is making by virtue of this phrase he uses, walk in love. Walking means to live. So we simply can't walk or live in love and also be walking or living in habitual sexual immorality, impurity, or covetousness all at the same time. And as we've all probably heard before, what's the best way to not develop a bad habit? Don't start it in the first place. And that's why we're not even to speak of that nasty stuff. And if that weren't enough, Paul then writes, in addition, let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are all in a place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Now, I don't think we have to spend a ton of time on the meanings of these words. They're up there. It's basically characterized by locker room talk. I think we all know what it means. What I want to focus on instead 
is how Paul seems to be building his argument here in steps. It's almost as though he's saying, let me help you see the steps to holiness. First, don't be riding dirty. Don't be all sneaky, professing a life of love, but secretly living a life of sin. Second, in fact, that's so bad, don't even be about the business of speaking about that nasty stuff. Don't even mention it. And then Paul steps back in this part and says, for that matter, don't speak in any crass way at all. No filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking. It's all on a place. It's not in step with living a life of love. It is not how we imitate God. It is not how we pursue holiness. We get caught up in all that stuff and it takes us from progressing away from progressing down that path. In fact, think about it this way. Would we ever talk that way if we were in the presence of God? But here's the thing. If we've been born again, then we are in His presence because the Holy Spirit of God dwells within us. Check out this quote from Charles Spurgeon. I'll read it to you. Dear brothers and sisters, honor the Spirit of God as you would honor Jesus Christ if He were present. If Jesus Christ were dwelling in your house, you would not ignore Him. You would not go about your business as if He were not there. Do not ignore the presence of the Holy Spirit in your soul. I beseech you, do not live as if you had not heard whether there were a Holy Spirit. To Him pay your constant adorations, reverence the august guest who has been pleased to make your body His sacred abode. Love Him, obey Him, worship Him. He is the Holy Spirit of God. We simply must not grieve Him with our sin. Instead, we must walk hand in hand with Him so that we can progress along that path to holiness. That's what Paul is showing us here. His argument is not clean up your life on the basis of morality so you can be a good guy. Rather, his argument is you're born again. You have a new life in Christ. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit, a guarantee of your salvation. So you're headed for heaven. Start living that way. That is his argument. And we can see that this is actually his main point because of the way he ends this sentence. And I absolutely love this. He writes, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Now, why thanksgiving? Could have been any other number of words, like praise, encouragement, worship. You could think of any number. But he doesn't. He says thanksgiving. But if you think about it, Thanksgiving is the natural response to Christ's love for us. 1 John 4 says, we love because God loved us. So we choose to love because we're imitating the fact that God has chosen to love us. Now, it doesn't go like this, this gratitude thing. And I want to be clear about this. Because so often we launch into a prayer by saying something like, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. That's not what we're talking about. And I'm not making fun of people who do that. What Paul's on about here is true, deep gratitude. An acknowledgement that, whoa, when my feet hit the ground that morning, the alarm goes off and I take off to work. The Lord has given me breath. He has given me light. He has given me food to sustain me. He has actually given me this amazing gift of a day. I don't know how many more I'm going to have, but I do know this. It is an amazing blessing. I get to enter into fellowship and relationship with other people. I get to glorify and honor Him. That is my motivation. That is what I'm focused on. That is gratitude, a deep sense of what God has done for us. It's so important that we see that. That is what progresses us down this path to holiness. And in many ways, this is perhaps... The biggest problem in my estimation of the Christian church today, now I've only been a pastor for a few years now, but this is what I've observed. Most Christians start by professing a faith. Either their parents do it or or they eventually do it. Then they get caught up in this narrative that Christians are supposed to be good, that they somehow need to be holy. So they try to clean up their act for the sake of being good and because the church 
just keeps talking about this thing called hell and it just doesn't sound like a very nice place and I don't want to end up there. So they basically attend church primarily out of obligation. They look for any excuse to miss and they daydream if they do end up coming. They think if they at least attend on holidays, maybe sit close to the front every now and then so the pastor sees them, clean up their act whenever they come through those doors so that they're seen as good enough by their family, friends, and neighbors, just maybe when they die, their pastor will proclaim in front of all their friends and neighbors that they're up there dancing with the angels. All because they did just enough for God to choose them to go to heaven so they could go spend time with their old dog. Now, this is just what I've observed. It's also very odd to me. It's in conversations with people. It's whenever I do a funeral. This is the discussion that's going on because so many profession Christians, they don't even really like church. They never desired to sing God's praise. They didn't desire or long to listen to the truth of God's Word proclaimed in a sermon. So what in the world makes them think that they're going to like heaven? I have no idea. But this seems to be the prevailing view. And if you still hold this position, then you've been daydreaming for all these sermons for more than a year now. Because Paul's been teaching us something completely different here. This is the truth of Scripture. First, God chooses us. We didn't choose Him. Those were Paul's opening lines in this letter that we started almost two years ago. He is the first mover. Second, Paul taught it's by God's gift of grace that he convicts and enables us to profess our faith in Jesus. Then he washes us in Christ's blood. He gives us his Holy Spirit who seals us until the day of redemption. Meaning, God not only forgave us, so we're now able to be in His presence in heaven for all eternity, but He also sent His Holy Spirit to guarantee our salvation, to make sure that we don't screw it up along the way. So if we've placed our faith in Jesus, we've been born again, we are going to heaven. It is a done deal. No matter what voices you're hearing, no matter what people suggest to you, no matter what the world tells you, no matter what Satan tells you, we are guaranteed we simply cannot blow it. It's a done deal. And what is the only response to something as great as this? Gratitude. Thanksgiving. Which is the motivation for holiness. Because of the gratitude that we have for all that God has done for us. Do you see this? It's so important that we grasp this critical point today. Not only do we tend to get the order wrong, as you see up there, but we also miss the point that thanksgiving is our motivation for holiness. It's because of who God is and what He has done for us that we can't help but desire holiness, and we do it for God's glory alone. That is why those words are up there behind me. It's why we can't help but to desire to obey God, to progress down the path to holiness, sure, every one of us is going to stumble. No shame in that. We get back up. We repent, and we continue to do the next right thing. We don't go about our lives riding dirty or speaking words that tempt others to participate in the nasty life on that wide, dark path that leads to eternal destruction. We don't live a life where we allow thoughts, words, or deeds to grieve the Holy Spirit God. No way. He's our seal. He's our guarantee. He is the one who's making us holy as He sanctifies us, preparing us to be the bride of Christ in heaven, convicting, counseling, and comforting us to be holy, all out of a genuine sense of gratitude, and for one single reason only, for God's glory alone. That's why we must put off all that old self stuff. That's why we must rid ourselves of habitual sin by repenting, turning to Jesus, imitating God, living a life of love. Not to get into heaven, but because we're already in. And we got to get ourselves ready for that big wedding day. Let's pray. Father, we are truly grateful for your word today. Beyond those words of simple gratitude, 
Lord Jesus, our hearts express a tremendous amount of appreciation for all that you do for us. Thank you for showing us this truth that we simply cannot imitate you walking in love while we're riding dirty with secret sin in our lives. Strengthen us to repent of our sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, and crude joking. Fill us instead with your spirit so that your fruit might ripen in our lives and that we might live out of gratitude and thanksgiving for all that you have done for us on the cross. We ask these things and whatever else you see that we need. For Jesus' sake. Amen.